it is a, a pleasure to speak here. And I only regret that I could not have asked Ruth uh, to critique my paper uh, before I was to give it, as she did it for me on more than one occasion in the past. So what follows is an assessment of the impact of climate change on the design of mosaics in the Holy Land from the 5th to the 8th centuries, particularly in the area to the east of the Jordan River and the Dead Sea. Although I do believe that my thesis is new, it owes much to the groundwork of Dan Reynolds and to his careful study of the circumstances surrounding Palestinian iconoclasm that appeared recently in Dumbarton Oaks papers. My presentation has four parts. The first is a brief survey of the iconography of the surviving floor mosaics in the region, focusing on motifs evoking the natural world. The second part explores how the nature-derived imagery may have functioned for the users of the mosaic floors. The third part summarizes, as well as I can, some of the scientific evidence for major climate change within the region between the 6th and the 8th centuries. The last and most speculative section of the paper raises questions about how environmental change may have affected depictions of nature in the mosaics and also the later erasure of those same images by iconoclasts in the middle of the 8th century. Among the vast corpus of floor mosaics in the early Byzantine world, those of Jordan stand out for the richness of their portrayal of nature, especially in pavements that were put down after the middle of the 6th century. In particular, several subjects evocative of water receive far more prominence in the church pavements of this region than they do in churches in other areas of Byzantium. These include personifications of the sea, the abyss and the ocean. On the screen, we see a remarkable personification of Thalassa framed by a medallion in a conspicuous location at the center of the nave of the Church of the Apostles in Madaba. The church is dated by inscription to the years 578 to 9. The goddess, for it seems almost appropriate to call her that, rises half naked from a sea filled with sprightly fishes. An inscription runs around the frame of the medallion, supplicating the, quote, Lord God who made the heaven and earth to give life to the donors and the artists of the mosaic. The inscription undercuts the status of the sea by describing her as a creation of God. But at the same time, the mosaic appears to honor her through her central place within the composition. In another Jordanian mosaic in the church of Bishop Sergius at Omar Rassas, dated to 587, a prominent place was given to a personification of the abyss. Here, the pavement of the nave was covered with large scrolls of acanthus, enclosing a variety of terrestrial motifs that were damaged in the 8th century by iconoclasts. Among these, at the center of the eastern row, was a figure carrying an oar and labeled Abyssos. The personification appears to have been riding on a giant sea creature. Directly opposite the abyss, at the western end of the nave floor, was a personification of the earth flanked by boys offering gifts of grain and fruit. A similar cast of characters occurs in the mid sixth century mosaic of the Southern Isle of the Church of Petra. Here we find personifications of ocean together with the earth and the four seasons accompanied by the creatures of sea, land and air. Ocean appears as a half naked man with claws growing out of his head, holding a ship in his left hand and an oar in his right and planting his left foot on a dolphin. Although personifications of ocean commonly appeared in the floor mosaics of Roman houses, especially in North Africa, it was rare for this pagan deity to invade the interiors of churches, and the Jordanian pavements are exceptional in this respect. Personifications of the four rivers of paradise are especially frequent in Jordan, even though they appear occasionally in floor mosaics elsewhere. They are portrayed in no less than five churches in Madaba and Omar Rassas, all dating to the second half of the 6th century 
and all of which suffered subsequent iconoclastic damage. The floor of the chapel of the Martyr Theodore, attached to the Cathedral Church of Madaba, provides an example. The rectangular central field of the mosaic, which was completed in 562, showed personifications of the four rivers, each labeled with its name, occupying the corners of a geometrical interlace. The other interstices of the interlace are filled with various subjects drawn from terrestrial nature, including fishes, birds, baskets of fruit, and farm workers. In the church of the Sunnah family at Madaba, and in the church of the rivers at Umar Rasas, the four rivers originally appeared in the corners of the borders that framed their pavements. Another church at Umar Rasas, that of the priest Wa'il, displayed the personification side by side in the western intercolumniation on the south. Streams of water issued from the now destroyed cornucopias held in their left hands. The nave pavement of the Church of St. Paul at Omar Rassas, probably to be dated to 578, presents a different type of composition, which is based upon the cross. But here too, the four rivers appeared in the corners. As in the chapel of the martyr Theodore, inscriptions name the personifications. The central part of the nave is filled by a square panel, which is divided into four quadrants by a swastika meander creating a cross. The rivers appear in medallions framed by the quadrants and they are shown by the blue arrows. They were seated figures, half naked and leaning on vases from which water flowed. The swastika meander framed five further personifications, a bust labeled Gi or the earth at the center of the cross, and that's the yellow arrow, arrow, and probably also the bust of a season in the middle of each of its four arms, and the green arrows point to the places where the seasons probably were. Here I have only presented a small sample of the unusually rich imagery of nature depicted in the churches of Jordan from the 6th to the early 8th century. Within this imagery, water played an especially important role, accompanied by personifications of the earth and the seasons, together with innumerable depictions of terrestrial creatures. Portrayals of human activities also were prominent, among which agriculture, animal husbandry, and hunting predominate. Although much of this iconography has parallels elsewhere in the mosaic production of the early Byzantine world, there is no doubt that there is a particular concentration in modern day Jordan. As is well known, in the middle of the eighth century, between 718 and 756, a sudden reversal took place, during which the motifs from nature in existing church pavements were partially erased. Subsequently, floor mosaics became primarily aniconic, for the most part no longer portraying humans or animals, and in some cases not even plants. The causes and nature of this iconoclasm are still under debate, but there is a general consensus on a few of its characteristics. First, the iconoclasm was by and large concentrated in those areas where we find the richest and most explicit evocations of nature on the pavements of churches, especially in the regions to the north and east of the Dead Sea. There was very little iconoclasm in Syria and none in Egypt. Second, the destruction was carried out by the Christians themselves. This is made clear by the care with which the offending representations were removed. After the iconoclasm, the floors were still usable by those who worshipped in the churches. Third, some motifs were deemed more inappropriate than others. There was a hierarchy of offensiveness. Thus, nature personifications were much more thoroughly erased than depictions of farm workers, hunters, or their animals, while plants were barely touched. The fourth point is that even though some of the figures were erased, the overall content of the mosaics usually remained intact and comprehensible. Often the outlines of the removed figures can still be recognized and their identifying inscriptions were frequently preserved. The final observation to be made about iconoclasm in the Holy Land is that it did not necessarily affect sacred portrait icons, 
such as portrayals of the Virgin and other saints appearing on the upper walls of churches. Hence, the iconoclasts appear to have been more concerned by images drawn from nature than they were by sacred portraits. I come now to the second part of my paper, which considers the function of nature-derived imagery for the users of the mosaic floors in Palestinian churches. Apart from displaying the diversity and extent of God's creation, as in the hexaemeron, the motifs drawn from nature acted as expressed wishes or prayers for agricultural prosperity. It should be remembered that most of the churches that we have been looking at were located in farming communities. The essential message of the mosaics is expressed by verses 15 and 16 of Psalm 115, from which the inscription surrounding the portrayal of Thalassa in the church of the apostles at Madaba quotes. So the psalm says, we are blessed by the Lord who made the heaven and the earth. The heaven of heaven is the Lord's, but the earth he gave to the sons of men. Often, the pavements in the churches of Jordan contain images of benefactors, several of whom were shown engaged with animals such as sheep or cattle. Sometimes they proffer animals in their arms, as can be seen here in the church of St. Stephen at Omar Rassas. These mosaics can be related to the small bronze ex votos portraying farm animals that have survived from early Byzantine Asia Minor, and I'm grateful to Brigitte Pitarakis for bringing them to my attention. Rings attached to the backs of some of these figurines show that they were made to be suspended. An example preserved in the British Museum portrays a bull with a cross between its horns. On its flanks are two inscriptions, also accompanied by crosses, which name the saints to whom the ex voto was dedicated, Saints Ktimon and Ripsis. Another statuette of a bull, now at Dumbarton Oaks, carried an apotropaic inscription incorporating the words apostrophicon imon, meaning perhaps our prevention or our refuge. A group of bronze harness fittings also associated with Asia Minor may have had a function similar to that of the animal statuettes. Since some of them appear too delicate for daily use, they may also have been intended as ex photos for presentation in churches. In many cases, the harness fittings are marked with crosses as shown in the example on the screen. A motif that commonly occurs in this group is a prominent bull or ox's head portrayed in relief at the center between the loops that held the straps of the harness. The bull's head is probably a reference to Bucephalos, the famed horse of Alexander the Great, which was associated with victory and good fortune. Thus, both the cross and the bull's head were propitious and protective motifs, which preserved from harm the animals belonging to the donor of the ex voto. The evidence of these ex votos suggests that the images of animals offered in churches, whether in bronze or in mosaic pavements, were intended not only to secure spiritual benefits, but also material ones, such as the health and safeguarding of livestock. As we have seen, some pavements, such as that of St. Paul at Omar Rassas, seen on the right, incorporated the elements of the natural world into cross-shaped compositions, if law preserved in the church of Deir Esbeb near Hama on the left, demonstrates the close association between the iconography of the pavement in St. Paul at Omar Rassas and the desire for good fortune. The mosaic of Deir Esbeb paves the south sacristy of the church and can be dated to the late fifth or the sixth century. Its central field consists of a square subdivided into nine smaller squares. The squares at the center of each side frame busts of the seasons, holding their appropriate attributes and identified by inscriptions. Thus, as apparently in the Church of St. Paul, the squares containing the seasons form the arms of a cross. The two squares on either side of spring on the left below contain animals, a bull, a lion and a bird, perhaps an ibis, which can be seen at the bottom. 
More remarkable are the animals in the two squares that flank winter at the top. On the left is a prancing horse with the label Agathoferon or the one who brings good. On the right appears a second horse with the inscription Niki. The horse on the left wore a plume between its ears, which identifies it clearly as a horse from the circus. There was a long association between the four chariots of the races and the seasons, which is attested both by floor mosaics and by literary sources. It is not certain whether the inscriptions beside the horses should be seen as their names or as general expressions of good fortune. There is no doubt, however, about the general import of the imagery. It is an appeal for favorable outcomes in the context of the potential bounty provided by the seasons, and this desire also must lie behind the imagery of the pavement of St. Paul at Omar Rassas. We move now from the propitious force of the imagery of church pavements in settlements around the Dead Sea to issues of climate change in the same area. The churches that we have been considering all fall within the drainage basin of the Dead Sea, which is indicated by the grey stippling on the map. The rising and falling levels of the sea indirectly reflect the amount of rain that has fallen within this whole region at any given time. The Dead Sea itself consists of two basins, a northern one and a southern one. When the water is high, the two basins are joined by a narrow channel, which is actually a sill, indicated by the red arrow on the map. The north basin is very deep, but the south basin is much shallower. When the water level in the north basin is elevated, it spills over the sill into the south basin, which becomes part of the sea. But when the water level is low in times of drought, the south basin eventually dries up altogether, leaving only the north basin with water. Over recent decades, several scientific studies have been devoted to the historical hydrology of the Dead Sea in an attempt to chart the rises and falls of its water levels. Although there are variations between different sets of results, which I'm unable to evaluate, not being a specialist in this area, the general picture appears to be that the water level of the Dead Sea became relatively high at the beginning of the Roman period, see the red arrow on the chart, and also towards the end of the Roman period, see the yellow arrow. That is, the level was high around the turn of the millennium and again at around 400 AD. At these times, levels were well above the sill, which is at 402 meters, meaning that both the northern and the southern basins would have been full of water. However, water levels dropped significantly between the 6th and the 8th centuries, resulting in the drying up of the southern basin, and for this see the blue arrow on the chart. In other words, beginning as early as the 5th century, there was a period of decreasing precipitation and relative drought in the region. The evidence for the rise and fall of the Dead Sea comes from more than one source. First, there is a paleolimnological data provided by the radiocarbon dating of organic debris left at successive shorelines as the sea retreated. The debris was derived from vegetation growing around streams and springs that fed into the sea. Another source of evidence is the analysis of pollen samples taken from cores extracted from the bottom of the North Basin. There is no time to go into the complexities raised by this diagram, but here is a simplified summary. Plant fragments were found embedded in laminated marls at the lower end of the core in the section marked by the red arrow, and these were dated by accelerator mass spectrometry. At the point marked by the yellow arrow in the middle part of the miles, that is around the second to the third centuries AD, high concentrations of pollen from cereals, olives, walnuts, and vines were found, reflecting cultivation of these species under the Romans. However, in the later upper part of these miles and in the salt layers above them marked by the blue arrow, the percentage of olive decreases 
while those of non-cultivated plants accustomed to more arid environments slightly increase. Even though this change in species may reflect socioeconomic factors, it may also signal a change in the climate becoming drier, extending from the later Byzantine into the Islamic periods. And finally, I have to art include art history, which provides some evidence of the impact of climate change in the design of the famous mosaic map in Madaba. This pavement probably dates to the second half of the sixth century or perhaps to the early seventh. It depicts Palestine and Northern Egypt with their geographical features such as seas, rivers, mountains, and cities with Jerusalem prominently shown. Significantly, the map only shows the northern basin of the Dead Sea, with the River Jordan entering it from the north. We do not see the southern basin or the channel that connects the two bodies of water. This appears to indicate that at the time that the map was made, the southern basin was dry. Now I come to the last part of this paper, the conclusion. In spite of some discrepancies between the various types of data, it does appear that the Byzantine period between the 5th and 8th centuries was a period of relatively low rainfall, especially when contrasted with the earlier higher stands of Roman times. In the agricultural communities to the east of the Dead Sea, located as they were and are on the edge of the desert, it must have been a worrying time. It is small wonder that they sought help from God by filling their churches with images of earthly and especially watery abundance. To put it simply, the less water we find in the Dead Sea, the more we find in the mosaics. But the apparent continuation of the drought into the 8th century raises a question. Why did the Christians of the region abruptly turn against the imagery of nature which they had employed so optimistically before. From St. Paul onwards, there had always been a latent concern in the church about the dangers of nature worship. As I have argued on previous occasions, in the 7th and 8th centuries, the advent of Islam in the East and of the iconoclastic dispute in the West focused people's minds more urgently on the question of which images should be considered transgressive. Some must have felt that by jettisoning images from nature, which were more likely to attract charges of paganism, they could more comfortably preserve the veneration of the portraits of Christ and his saints. But perhaps also there was another motif, motive behind the iconoclasm, a sense that the nature images were no longer working, as it were, for the benefit of the donors of the mosaics and of the congregations that use them. Some Christians of the region may have felt that their previous embrace of blatant nature imagery, far from persuading God to help them, was in fact having the opposite effect and incurring his displeasure. Hence, communities who once had walked upon pavements teeming with terrestrial life suddenly rejected their earlier creations the iconoclasts kept the outlines of the nature images together with their identifying inscriptions so that the subjects were still recognizable. In this way, they made the act of erasure visible to all. They demonstrated their rejection of images celebrating nature, not only themselves, but to their neighbors and also to God.